which reveal his passion for painting and his love for his family. We watch him developing observational skills and follow the creation of many of his compositions. And the letters reflect aspects of contemporary social life. He met and knew many of the leading politicians, liberal thinkers, aristocrats, society hostesses and artists, as well as Spanish royals and American magnates and local tipos or types, and takes them all in his stride. Witty vignettes reveal his thoughts and make Soroya come alive for us. He was not the only artist to paint prolifically and still make time to write. Over 500 of Michelangelo's letters survive. Goya wrote many, as did Delacroix, Van Gogh and Monet. And Whistler wins the prize with over 13,000. Soroya's correspondence, as you've heard, consists of over 8,000 items, including letters, receipts, documents, bills, telegrams, which, thanks to the generosity of his wife, Clotilde, were given to the family archive after his death in 1923. And the most important letters have been made public. There is also the correspondence between Archer Huntington and Soroya, and Huntington's diaries, which are in the Hispanic Society, uh, in New York. There are three published volumes of letters by Soroya, which are a valuable source of information for enthusiasts and scholars. And thanks for these are due to curators past and present of the Soroya Museum, to Blanca Pons Soroya, the artist's great granddaughter, and to his grandson, Victor Llorente Soroya, as well as to Spanish scholars who've edited them. And these are the letters to which I will be referring. The first volume, published in 2007, contains the correspondence between Soroya and Pedro Gil Moreno de Mora, a friend from Soroya's student days at the Spanish Academy in Rome in the 1880s. Gil was a painter, a well-to-do banker with a home in Paris, who as well as being a loyal friend, encouraged and helped him in his early career and introduced him to interesting and influential people. Two volumes of letters from Soroya to Clotilde, whom he married in 1888, were published in 2008 and 2009, and span the years from January 1891 to August 1919. We find out much about his personality, as well as how he worked. Some of Clotilde's correspondence to Soroya has been included in the excellent footnotes of these two volumes and has also been quoted in several exhibition catalogues. And a small part of it is still unpublished and remains in the family archive. There are also understandable gaps in their correspondence when the couple were actually both together at the same time, mm -hmm. mainly in 1903, 1904 and 1905. Soroya was often absent from his family. He visited Paris frequently and travelled all over Spain, as well as in England and America. Clotilde is described by Archer Huntington at her husband's highly successful exhibition in the Hispanic Society in 1909 as a small, shy, smiling woman, proud, <coughs> proud of her husband's achievement, who shines through as Soroya's muse and great love, but practical and with a sense of humour. She accepts her role and gives total support to her husband. She keeps the family accounts, meticulously recording sales of his paintings in small notebooks, and Soroya names her his Minister for Finance. <laughs> Soroya acknowledges Clotilde as the rock of his life, without whom he could not have achieved what he did. As Huntington wrote in his diary in 1918, she must bear the weight of the family and of sharing her life with a genius. Without her, Soroya would surely not have achieved what he has. Soroya, as you've already heard, was prolific, producing thousands of paintings. We'll hear more from Monica. And yet still managed a large correspondence. Today, of course, he would have picked up, picked up the phone or emailed, and we would have missed out. In his early letters to Pedro Gil, his de facto agent in Paris, he asks advice in dealing with the practicalities of exhibiting his paintings in the Paris salons. 
the first published letter from uh, to Heal from June 1886, describes my good Clotilde as an angel and also says how much he, he appreciates his friend's opinion. Soroya shared his doubts and successes and family news with Heal over many years. In 1889, when the young couple are living in Assisi, he draws this lovely pen and ink head of Clotilde in a letter to Heal. In October 1892, Soroya is delighted to tell his friend I always want to give you good news. I've sold a female nude that I showed in the Madrid exhibition for 7,000 pesetas. You can understand how thrilled I am. He received Soroya's salon paintings, arranged frames, arranges frames, sorts out the hanging, customs dues, and exchange rates. In 1893, Soroya writes, you know how long I've wanted to exhibit something in the Paris salon. I have at last finished it, and today I am sending it, having it sent to you, so you can arrange a frame and deliver it. The practical heel replies a couple of days later. The painting, the reliquary, arrives safely, and I like it a lot. <coughs> As there is no time to have a frame made, I found an old one, which they will cut to fit your painting. Kissing the relic showcased Soroya's skill at subtle lighting in a costume Brista subject and won a third class medal, which was a huge achievement and went on to win further medals in Vienna and Bilbao, where it hangs today. Early in his career, Soroya was naturally anxious about supporting his wife and growing young family. So in early 1894, he's delighted to tell Heel, I sold the painting of another margarita in Chicago at the World Fair for 10,800 pesetas for the Museum of St. Louis, and adds, half-jokingly, that now he can provide his children with a crust of bread. <laughs> Soroya also asks his friend to buy a plaster cast, a plaster cast of a small victory that is in the Louvre. Today, this remains in the Soroya Museum on his David, and was possibly his first source of inspiration for the Grecian robes in beach scenes, although we know he admired the Parthenon frieze in the British Museum in 1908. Soroya, like most of us, could be forgetful, and in March 1894 writes to Heal, annoyed that he's missed the admission date for the salon. He hears about this from Aureliano Beruete, his friend, the painter and art historian, and asked Beruete to use his influence to see if he can help him, but he can't. Soroya had been given the dates by Heal, but perhaps letters are crossed in the post. So he learns the hard way and asks Heal to give him advance notice of the closing date for the following year's salon. He intends to exhibit the return from fishing, which we've seen several times today a sketch of which he includes in a letter. <clears throat> and white slave trade, which he draws in a letter to Heal at the beginning of January 1895. As you can see, this is somewhat different from the finished painting. In January 1895, he wrote, I'm really pleased with the way painting white slaves is going. All are sleeping except a young student type. In early March 85, 1895, Soroya informs Heal that this painting has been shipped to Paris unframed, as it would be too big and heavy otherwise, and adds, this is because the picture is not rolled, as it's still too fresh, and requires a very large crate, which will be even larger when framed. He sends a diagram with measurements of the stretcher so he can order a frame for it. When the painting arrives in Paris, it didn't include the young man from the sketch, which he thinks is a pity. Soroya replies, he gave in to opinion. I was a pushover and got rid of the man because everyone said it bothered them. And I can assure you he was painted well enough. <laughs> Heal advises that the painting would further benefit from the removal of a small window on the left, so Savoya instructs him to fold back the canvas, reducing the width to fit the frame, and later this was cut off. 
Among the letters to Hill, we read of works that no longer exist. In the summer of 1895, Soroya sketches Valencia Beach, describing it as all in the sun. This was shown in the 1898 salon, bought by the Uruguayan collector Emilio Goldaracena, and eventually acquired by the Jockey Club of Buenos Aires. Sadly, this was destroyed, along with a Goya portrait of Isabel de Porthel's husband in a fire there in 1953. During the 1890s, Soroya was making his name, winning prizes and medals, and developing his artistic identity. In 1896, he writes to Heal, hinting that he's found his real style in his salon painting, The New Sail, as he calls it then, showing some girls sewing a sail in a patio with playful sunlight through the leaves. I don't know what you will think of it. I believe it quite daring because working from life is extremely difficult. However, if it were merely well received, it would be, mean so much to me already and would encourage me on my new path. He worries about the way Spanish paintings are displayed in the 1900 International Exhibition. Yesterday I read in a paper that the rooms allocated to Spain are small and gloomy and half the size of the French section. An echo sister Clotilde. Mm -hmm. Poor Hill, ever in the service of his friend, tried to get the display changed but was unsuccessful. We're informed what portraits he's painting. In May 1905, he tells Hill, I'll soon begin a portrait of Eche Garay. It will be the 25th portrait I have done since November. You can imagine the tiredness I feel. Who wouldn't, frankly? I've painted a big picture, a group of eight people, Americans. This is in fact the portrait of the Chilean diplomat Rafael Eraduriz and family. In 1895, he'd done four decorative panels for Rafael's house in Valparaiso in Chile. There are six blonde children and the mother is very sweet. He comments on his first royal sitting in La Granja, 1907, when his daughter Maria is recovering from TB and the young king, handsome in his magnificent hussar's uniform. At times, we witness his frustration with sitters. In 1913, he is in Paris, painting the American industrialist Thomas F. Rahn, whom he met in the States, and grumbles to Clotilde, I can't do what I want, because Mr. Rahn is accompanied by a lady who won't leave me in peace for a minute with her little impertinences and silly remarks, which are more tiring than going up to Cuesta de las Perdices in August. <laughs> this is where he'd rented a house in April. The lady was, I'm not sure she is a lady, the lady was herself painted by Soroya in early October and became Ryan's second wife a mere 12 days after the, first, after the death of his first wife in 1917. Heel helps to coordinate Soroya's first solo show in the prestigious Galerie Georges Petit in 1906, advising on publicity, suggesting an illustrated catalogue, and arranging the delivery of 57 crates in which 497 works are packed. Only one arrived damaged. He's adamant that Soroya's private view must not begin on a Sunday, as this is a bad day to invite the press and official visitors like the President of the Republic, the Arts Minister, and the Spanish Ambassador. Mm. Poor Soroya writes in turn that his nerves are on edge and his fear of the exhibition is huge. 400 works is madness for a foreigner. <laughs> when he is away, Soroya misses him. Paris without you is not Paris, it is a desert. <laughs> Heel boosts Soroya's confidence during his London exhibition of 1908 at the Grafton Galleries, whose walls are hung with red velvet and has green doors. He advises him to stay for at least the first month of the show and encourages Soroya, who is disappointed with slow sales, by saying, the first 100,000 francs are difficult to earn, then it gets easier. And when Soroya complains about the high commissions asked by the organisers for portraits, as we've heard he didn't get many, 
The ever calm financial expert Heal points out the difficult economic circumstances of, of the times, saying he could lower his prices a bit. However, Soroya feels it's always better not to sell than to lower prices. When apart, Soroya wrote almost daily, as we've heard, to Clotilde, and sometimes twice. And it's as if the couple were chatting. It was a vital communication to share the day's events with his wife, whom he missed hugely. We read about the highs and lows, the weather, food, people he meets, cold hotels, <coughs> bad roads, postal services, presents for his children, his elation when a painting is working, the cost and quality of models, and so on. Clotilde did not in the end join her husband for the London exhibition, but she sent him orange blossom. He, when working on the vision of Spain, kept her supplied with poses of violets or baskets of fruit. The letters to Clotilde from London show us how Soroya occupied his time. He stays in the Hotel Previtale, this is it, doesn't look very exciting, <coughs> run by Italians, eats at the Savoy and the Café Monico, very fashionable, and he describes a three-hour which he found rather long, a three-hour car journey to lunch near Hazelmere, Surrey, with Mr. Cheshire, one of the three sponsors of the show. And though the countryside is very beautiful, he finds the spring colours in England monotone. <laughs> and he is unsettled by British reserve, which he admits is so different to his own character. He's taken to a music hall, walks a lot, buys paints, is assiduous in his visits to galleries and explores practically all the museums. He's summoned to the palace to paint Princess Beatrice, mother of the Queen of Spain. John Singer Sargent and the Swedish artist Anders Zorn both visit his exhibition. They're both pretty big men, as you can see. <laughs> He's entertained by Sargent and his sister. Zorn, a good friend of Soroya's, later travelled to Spain and shared a train journey with Soroya to Avila when he was preparing studies for the background of Castilla. This is obviously much earlier, but is in the current exhibition. Zorn managing to consume three bottles of champagne on the journey, <laughs> not that game. <laughs> His descriptions of English life are graphic. The weather is grey, grey, grey and depressing. <laughs> Yet during a rare two days of sunshine and warmth, he delights in the sight of hundreds of people lying on the grass in London parks. He finds the short art working hours of the English frustrating, regales Clotilde with descriptions of English cooking. Now I've got a slightly different translation to Gabrielle. He writes, I've eaten some salmon, which could be described as the king of dishes. This the English stew, like nobody else would. <laughs> he describes a banquet at the Royal Academy with the Prince of Wales as guest of honour and dinners here at the Spanish Embassy. He is entertained in private houses, goes to musical soirees where everyone sings badly, which, he writes, is very bad for the digestion. <laughs> he attends a dinner of a circle of 3,000 women, I don't know what they were, maybe the Women's Institute, which was very jolly, but my goodness, what horror. They're all ridiculous old ladies in décolleté dresses, caked in makeup. <laughs> Unflattering English fashions. You can see one drawn in a letter here. Uh, make women look like parrots with short tail coats going to a point <laughs> at the back. And as we've heard, he's enthusiastic about making a journey in an underground train called a tube, which is 30 metres deep and goes very fast. He briefly considers visiting every year to paint portraits here, but was concerned that there are 7 million people in London, and of those 7 million, probably 1,000 to 1,500 who are seriously interested in art. Those who buy, about 500. I don't care for the huge remainder, he says, nor do they for me. <laughs> Importantly, he sells two paintings to an American gentleman, who of course turns out to be Archer Huntington from New York, and his great patron. 
Soroya was hardworking and ambitious. His 1909 New York exhibition was a huge success. And with the Buffalo and Boston shows that year, netted him very difficult to work out equivalent uh, prices, but roughly four to five million pounds today. Not bad. Before the London exhibition, Soroya was summoned to the Alcázar in Seville in early February 1908 to paint the Queen's <coughs> portrait. The beginning of the trip does not begin auspiciously. News of the assassination by Republicans of the King of Portugal and his eldest son in Lisbon shocks the royal family. But two days later, the Queen recovers enough for her first sitting. And Soroya comments that she's lovely and it could be a stupendous portrait which is already drawn in and will begin painting the following day. Clotilde teases him, remarking the papers say the Queen is so beautiful she looks like a Rubens. Soroya, apprehensive about his forthcoming London show, is assured by the Queen that the English are nice people. <laughs> he is torn between wanting to paint in the Alcatha Gardens and getting on with the royal portrait, and also finds himself committed to painting the King's Chamberlain, the Marquis de Viana. Sittings are usually in the morning for around an hour. By mid-February, he's in super energetic mode and writes that he's had sessions with the Queen and Viana and has done a study in the gardens. He suffers from the cold and lack of comfort as the palace wasn't heated. And updates Clotilde saying he's lunched alone and is desperately missing her. He has pains in his shoulder, has smoked a cigar and was thinking of her and his favourite Vierna de los Desamparados, the patroness of Valencia, to whom he always prays. During this month in Seville, he paints 16 studies of the Alcatha Gardens and City Views, and recounts a delightful story. The Queen kept me company while I painted the crown, which a young lady in waiting had on. The Queen laughed a lot at the embarrassment of the young English girl, sitting on the throne, modestly dressed, and with a magnificent crown of diamonds on her head. It was really funny. But later, he painted the crown out uh, at the Queen's request. Soroya's interest in republicanism in his youth and in the liberal regenerationist politics of Hine de los Rios, Beruete, Cossio, and the Institución Libre de Enseñanza, his children attended one of their schools, were not incompatible with his loyalty to the royal family. And he painted some 17 royal portraits. In turn, Alfonso XIII admired Soroya as a Velazquez who knew how to paint sunlight and encouraged him to accept Archer Huntington's commission for the vision of Spain which the King saw as a major international PR exercise in promoting Spanish culture, especially after the 1898 loss of Spain's last colonies. In both sets of letters, uh, Soroya rarely mentions political events. In 1898, 1898, at the height of the Spanish-American War, he writes to Hill, I'm not painting, eating, or really living. And it makes me so sad to think of those poor, ordinary soldiers fighting in Cuba. Those are the only people who have a real idea of patriotism. He is shocked by the brutality of the assassination attempt in Madrid on the King and Queen's wedding day in 1906. In the middle of the First World War, in which Spain remained neutral, Soroya, in a letter to Huntington in 1916, writes, at a time when the whole world is thinking only of war, I have scarcely been aware of it at all, although it does move me to the depths of my soul. It is clear how much Soroya thrives in bright sunshine. Wet, cold, windy weather affect him to the core, and he finds it difficult to work. He visits Javier for the first time in 1896, telling Clotilde, this is the place I've always dreamed of, sea of mountains, but what a sea! And Cape San Antonio is another marvel, an enormous reddish monument, and its colour in the water gives it a clarity, and a pure brilliant green, an enormous emerald. 
in July 1905, the family holiday in Javier, and he tells Heel that they're enjoying a scene so blue and violent that it delights the soul. He produces 30 paintings and 75 sketches that summer. In November 1907, he writes from Valencia to Clotilde in Madrid, I've so enjoyed the splendid spectacle of so much light and colour. I watch the return from fishing, the beautiful sails, the groups of fishermen, the lights of a thousand colours reflected in the sea. It's a shame to live in Madrid. It would be so wonderful to be living near a port and above all, for the five of us to be together. The letters help us to date the logistics of the vision of Spain and Soroya's working methods. What appears a rapidly painted canvas often involves weeks of preparation. He deliberates over his subject matter. In a letter from Seville in 1914, he writes to Clotilde, I smoke and smoke. Think of the painting I have before me, this unknown work, the canvas as yet quite blank, and I shift it this way and that with the composition, moving it up and down, shuffling the figures as I please. The background to the roundup, El Enfiero, was begun in Jerez de la Frontera, to which he moved from the discomforts of Seville with its heat and mosquitoes, as a guest of Senor Pedro González Gordon, between the 8th to 15th of October 1914, on the El Cuco estate, which looks pretty substantial. The house was knocked down later on and replaced by a school. Sir Royer was originally thinking of a painting of vineyards and does nine studies of the grape harvest. He tells Clotilde, I could be painting this in Valencia or in China, but the important thing is the colour of the vines as a whole. He entertains her with pen pictures of life in the Gonzalez household, which is run according to English lines, especially meals and tea. And the Gonzalez are very charming and have lots of married and single children and a cloud of grandchildren. It's enough to tell you that one of the daughters has 10 children, the other, who has been married five years, has five. <laughs> This happens a lot in Jerez, he says. <laughs> he moves to Tabladilla near Seville and paints trumberas, prickly pears. It is his half century, his 50th birthday, and he declares his love for Clotilde. How old we are. May God bless my lovely wife and give me half a century more. In late October, he makes studies of horsemen and bulls, writing, these are not like the bulls on the beach. Far from it, they were ferocious models. The one up that I was interested in was in a fury and attacked another bull, he writes, and that one ends up spearing Soroya's nag on its horns. The Catalonia, the Catalonia panel took Soroya a total of three months, from mid-September to mid-December 1915. We learn the composition is a com combination of places. After a month's research, he settles on Santa Cristina, near Lloret de Mar, some 70 kilometres from Barcelona, for the background. It reminds him of Javier. It's wonderful, great pine trees on the mountain with clear, colourful reefs, onto a marvellous blue and green sea. There's something Greek about it, and it is stupendous. Here it is today, sort of. <laughs> By late November, he writes about his increasingly poor health, but advises Clotilde on garden matters. I would put in another apple tree, and don't forget the rose bushes. He moves to Bavalonetta to paint fishes and fishermen, and the canvas was completed by mid-December, thanks to ten successive days of hard work and sunshine. The market, Extremadura, was challenging, and he was exhausted by it. He arrived in Placencia in October 1917, where he had difficulty sleeping and was advised to take hot baths. The area is, of course, famous for its hamon, and he regards the Iberian black pig, oops, sorry, the Iberian black pig detail here, who feeds on the local acorns 
as the most disagreeable animal in all creation. <laughs> Dirty and horrible, revolting. He works rapidly, painting nine figures in seven days, and worries that Clotilde is not receiving his daily letters. Anxiety is what consumes my life. I lack Velasquez phlegm. I am just very tired. With, a cup, with some relief a couple of days later, he says, I've finished the piggies. And two days later, the canvas is dry enough to roll up. I don't feel in the mood to paint, he says, in Holy Week in March 1918, but it matters little. Life is more than just painting, however much I always paint with my eyes. Throughout his career, his observation was acute. Elche was a canvas composed of different separate locations too. Soroya travels to Alicante, initially with his son Joaquin in late September 1918. The impression Alicante gives is dry, but the sea is so beautiful, the light so divine that I hope it will be what I want. But there's an outbreak of the fatal Spanish flu in Elche itself, so the painting is actually done in a small palmary near Alicante, belonging to a helpful Senor Soler. Soroya enthuses, it doesn't seem like Europe, it's pretty unusual seeing so many palm trees. And what a view, at the foot of the palm grove with views of Alicante and the sea. It is unique, unforgettable. He prepares by taking photos of groups of people and asks for the carpenter to send canvas, his long brushes and a large palette. He's two particularly good models, we know their names, Dolores and Rosario and by late November draws in the composition in just four days. The sun is beautiful, the people and the man with loads of golden fruit. How wonderful! And notices dates have more colour than even an orange. Mm -hmm. He has an expensive ladder made, which makes it easier for him to paint, rather than balancing precariously on boxes. <coughs> and he sends pomegranates and dates to Clotilde. The painting is going well, and he writes, 12th of December 1918, it's the best thing in the world to make art, and it would be ideal to paint a work like this in one go, but that is to dream the impossible. Late in December, needing to settle up his expenses, Soroya reports to his Minister for Finance, Clotilde, <laughs> saying he must repay a 300% alone and pay for his lodgings and car <laughs> He misses Christmas with the family for the first time in order to finish this panel, which takes 30 sessions. He begins the final canvas of Ayamonte in May 1919. Again, he travels along the coast, searching for a suitable backdrop, writing to Coatilde that he finds the Portuguese dirty and sad. Frustratingly, he cannot find Portuguese costumes, sees fish, that seem as big, of, big as horses, and dreams of a picture which will have the beauty of the Catalonia panel. We know the Hispanic Society Commission has taken its toll when he comments, this journey is a calvary. I'm worn out, and I admit I'm not young enough to put up with these hardships. I'm going to stop in a minute, or you too will be feeling worn out. <laughs> the letters to Pedro Gil and to Clotilde are informative and immediate. Through them, we share Soroya's enthusiasm, anxiety, his family, and his travels. His charm, humour, affection, and that ever-observant eye shine through. William Starkweather, his American friend, wrote, There is nothing he cares about save his family and his art. To these two objects, he has devoted his whole life. His letters prove this, and we're very fortunate to have them. Thank you.